Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is John DiLorenzo, and uh, for my capstone project, I did U.S. Steel. So let's get started. Now let's get started. So U.S. Steel was founded in uh, early 1900s, and uh, it's in the steel industry, obviously, which is an incredibly volatile and cyclical market, and it has history of showing that. Uh, some cool facts are it's the first billion-dollar company in terms of revenue, and uh, as of 2019, it is a top three steel uh, manufacturer in the U.S. Uh, the most notably, it's the number one integrated mini or excuse me integrated steel maker in the uh, country. And just for some background on what an integrated production method is, is you have a blast furnace, which is a, a giant furnace, and what you do is you have iron pellets and then your fuel source and you stack them on each other like a cake the fuel source primarily being coke which is just baked coal until it's essentially pure carbon pure carbon and what you do is you melt the iron into liquid iron and then once once you look have that liquid iron you transfer it into a furnace where you add different alloys and different uh like lime uh ferromanganese vanadium things like that into getting the specific chemistry that your customer requires once you have liquid steel you move it into a caster which is basically a mold for it to cool into giant what looks like almost kit kat bars seriously and um at that point you can transfer it to the, your different production units to get it to this proper sizing um you flatten it out into a uh, roll kind of like a big sheet roll uh a sheet piece of sheet dough for like baking like cookies or something like that literally and then at that point you roll it into a coil which looks like a paper towel so you basically have a giant paper towel of steel that you'll then sell to your customer and they will use it for their production methods but that in itself is an integrated process conversely with the mini mill which we'll touch on a bit later so just for high level of the industry it was started in the 1860s with the Bessemer pro process However, uh, it didn't really ramp up until the 1880s, 1900s. You still came in at the tail end of the 1900s and in the 1910s. Uh, there are three business segments, flat roll, tubular, and Europe. Uh, flat roll is the integrated uh, process that I touched on a bit earlier, uh, primarily selling to your automobile uh, manufacturers or your appliance manufacturers. Tubular is more so your, your pipe, so it's your deep sea uh, drilling with oil or natural gas. And then Europe is the flat roll segment. However, it's just with the European market. Again, it's a key player in the flat roll market, but with the new technology, it's a touch compromise. Uh, some of the flat roll production units in U.S. Steel are from the 50s. So we're dealing with 70 plus year old technology. Obviously, things have improved since then, so that, that kind of hinders their progress. So for some pestle analysis, um, it's, a good, it's good for the economy whenever steel demand is high because that means there's a lot of projects going on a lot of rebuilding constructions high people are buying so it's just a good space to be in um, however depending on your perspective imports from china specifically are uh, are diluting the market with quality product from quality product with not so quality costs are better i mean cash is king right but if the product quality is not quite there then that's a little bit unfavorable uh, for economic, there's it's a global market, tons of variables, tons of variables um, like iron ore availability in South America could affect production costs in Gary, Indiana. Social, um, if people know more about the quality of U.S. steel, they may be a little bit more inclined to buy a product or the, if assuming they know. And that's that's the end goal. If people this, from a conversation I had with uh, the CEO, Dave Burt, he mentioned that he basically wants to get to a point where people acknowledge U.S. Steel is a high quality product and I want to buy this widget from so and so because I know it has U.S. Steel steel in it. So for technology, it's an incredibly costly uh, investment to get into the game of steelmaking, uh, millions if not billions of dollars minimum. From an environmental perspective, it's it's a dirty bit, uh, production process. It's better than it was, but it's still very dirty. So you need to make sure that you have your business processes to keep everything clean as best as possible, because if not, you could do some real damage to your local ecosystem, natural ecosystem. And then from a legal perspective, you're dealing with unions, you're dealing with zoning laws, you're dealing with all of that. So you need a copious amounts of permits just to build the production facility itself, let alone dealing with clientele. Uh, so for some five forces, there I have five listed here, um, two that are not so impactful, two that are decently impactful, 
and then one that we don't really, there's no really need to touch on. So the two that are not so impactful are threat of new entry and threat of substitution. You can't really do, you can't really get into the steel industry easily. It's just the scope is Im immense. The fixed costs are immense. You're looking at billions of dollars, years of, pro uh, of work and project managing, and you need subject matter experts that know the chemistries and how to run these production units just to even get into the game. And again, it's not even a fruitful business some of the time. You know, you're running in, uh, in the red, but you can't stop running. So you got to consider that. And then threat of substitutions are low because for the for the weight, it still is a very durable product. It's a very durable uh, item. So you can't really substitute it effectively with anything else. Uh, the main pressure, the, ma the, the main uh, power is the uh, power of buyers. So if demand is low, margins are squeezed, fixed costs are so immense so that you can't really stop producing or else you're just going to be burning through cash. Um, so you have to keep producing, but at the same time, if demand is low, you want to be cognizant of that because you don't want to overflow. You don't want to dilute and uh, oversaturate your market with inventory that people don't want. Because then whenever they get to the point where they do want it, you're going to have excess, but you can't stop running anyway because you're going to be burning through cash. So you have to be very cognizant of how much you have. And then the second one is uh, your competitive rivals. Uh, mini mill producers are kind of the kind of in charge at the moment. Like they're they're leading the market. Newcore being a mini mill producer, that's number one in the U.S. What the way the way mini mill a mini mill is compared to integrated? You have a bowl. Literally think of a double boiler. So you double boil chocolate or like hollandaise sauce or something. It's the same idea with steel um, production. It's just instead of chocolate, you have steel scrap. So in terms of is the industry attractive, I would say no. So an example touching on is an EAF in Fairfield that US still has. They already had the infrastructure there. They already had the production plant there. They were just kind of adding to a uh, blast furnace to turn it from a blast furnace into an EAF, into a mini mill. And uh, that alone was 100 million plus in project costs and five years of project managing with subject matter experts. If it was on a scale of 0% to 100%, 100% being it's running and ready to produce, um, they were starting at like 40% and these were the stats that we had. So if you're starting from zero, you're looking at maybe even double this. Uh, for some SWOT analysis, they're a very strong brand. Everybody knows U.S. Steel in the market. Everybody knows that they ha they've they been around for over 100 years, massive footprint in the market. Their weakness, though, is their technology. So some of the production units that they have are from, honestly, from the 50s, if not 40s and 30s. So closing in on 100-year-old technology, things have greatly improved since then, and uh, they, they, they're working towards getting that. But it's again, it's costly. It's very... Um, for example, they're looking at investing over $1.2 billion over the next two or three years. And that's just kind of raising the standard that they're at. They're not, it's not even buying new uh, pro, um, production units. It's literally just enhancing what they have. And that's going to cost over a billion dollars. So it's, it's tough. Uh, but their opportunities, though, is kind of going into that investments so with the $1.2 billion. They're working towards a best of both strategy. So we've talked about the integrated and the mini mill production method. They are uh, they recently acquired 49.9% of Big River Steel, which is a mini mill in Arkansas. And uh, they're looking to offset the lows of the integrated, which is really favorable if pre steel prices are high. The margins are incredible. But in the inverse is true for mini mills. So if margin or if prof, uh, prices are low, mini mill margins are favorable versus in integrated is not so much so they that one offsets the other type of thing and if you have both effectively you can kind of weather any market condition at least that's the theory and then they have other revenue sources so you still owns their own mines they have a couple of joint ventures in brazil and in canada so there's options for other revenue sources with selling their own raw materials also to note they have their own coke making facility clariton which is the number one coke facility uh, producer in the world so in theory, they could also sell Coke to other integrated steel producers. Um, some threats are increased competition just through mini mill uh, productivity because it's a little bit more agile. They have more favorable margins and down markets, which seems to be the trend. So they're, they're eating away at the, uh, the market share of U.S. Steel and then you, dying industry. 
Um, pe because of the flow of technology, things are getting more advanced, things are getting more efficient, so you need less steel to do the same thing, and it's just the demand is not quite as high. Some core competencies, there are two main ones. It's a strong brand, Im strong brand image and then managing supplier power. Uh, we'll touch a bit more on those. Well, strong brand image is that U.S. Steel, is it's been around for 100 years, and from a managing supplier power, their procurement organization has done a fantastic job of mitigating influence of their costs by suppliers, so they've done a great job of negotiating payment terms and pricing and things like that. Uh, weaknesses of the supply chain um, is their operations. We touched on the technology. It's hard to be agile with technology that was made in the 40s. And for their strengths is their best of both. If they can incorporate and successfully accomplish this goal, they're looking pretty healthy because they get the best of both. From a competitive strategy, it's absolutely cost focused at the moment with a long-term focus on differentiation. Um, best of both is the future. I, I harp on this again and again. The benefits of the mini mill production in down markets offsets the negative of integrated in down markets, and the inverse is true as well. So if they're able to capitalize on both, they'll be able to basically survive any market. So from a foreign market perspective, we touched on Europe very briefly at the beginning of this presentation. Uh, USSK Koshito is a production flat roll production um, facility in Slovakia. And that is U.S. Steel's European presence. They had a mill in Serbia, but they had to sell it. We'll not get into that. They, uh, they're they working towards other opportunities, but at the moment, they're really ideally... That $1.2 billion investment I mentioned earlier, some of that dollars are going into updating their Dynamo line, which is just one of the production units. It's one of the more marketable and desired product types in Europe and they're, they're working towards really kind of enhancing that Koshitsa facility. And then they have two joint ventures of note, one in Brazil, one of Canada. Brazil being a uh, iron ore producer and uh, Canada just being another um, production flat roll facility. Uh, from an organization pers uh, perspective, organization structure perspective, it's a combination of both vertical and flat, although it leans vertical. Uh, an example would be their procurement organization. You have your CFO uh, at the top, and then underneath it, you have the general manager of procurement. And then underneath that, you have your directors and uh, or managers. And then under those, you have your day-to-day -day analysts. The VP, the CFO, is looking at uh, strategy from a strategic perspective. If you look at your Anthony's triangle, strategy, which is two to five years, directors is one to two years, and then underneath them, you have your managers, but usually your analysts of uh, one to two, excuse me, of your day-to-day -day operational tasks. Um, the successes and failures of it is, uh, from a deliverables perspective, they're fantastic. They're top of the line, and they're, they do a fantastic job of meeting deliverables. However, depending on your perspective, um, they fall short on the human element. So market perception is that they're, they're it's kind of like we do what they meet the deliverable at any cost, even if that's at the expense of, uh, uh, not that they do anything unethical, but it's, 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 it's all numbers driven. It's not human business oriented or even influenced. From an ethics perspective, uh, U.S. still has Gary principles, which is basically their guiding. It, Gary was their first, uh, it's his last name, but it was their first president. And, um, his, his biggest thing was do the right thing. That was a slogan. And there are a couple of other, um, slogans that go along with that, but that's the main thing. So at the end of the day, no matter what you do, adhere to doing the right thing and everything else will take care of itself. Um, and ethically as well, they have several ERGs or employee resource groups. Um, one being for women, primarily in the, specifically for women in the marketplace, uh, in, in the professional industry, and then for your LGBTQT, um, for example, CEO Dave Barrett was at walking in the pride parade. So, you know, that's pretty cool. And then human resources, they have a move up the talent curve, which is really like we want to attract and uh, we want to attract, attract, retain, and enhance the top talent in the market. So that's that is the big initiative from an HR perspective, headed by their uh, VP of HR Barry Mel Milinkovic. Um, and then some recommendations because we're getting close to the end here is uh, you got to continue with the best of both strategies, utilizing the best of uh, mini mill and integrated facilities, looking to other revenue sources, such as uh, selling pig iron, iron pellets, or coke, investing wisely, that 1.2 million I mentioned before, and then just continually enhancing on the brand image.
make people want to buy stuff that has US Steel on it. So that's all I have. We're coming in on 15 minutes. Thank you for your time. Let me know your feedback. And if you have any questions on US Steel or the steel industry, I'd be happy to help. Thank you.